We don't usually have a, a song introduction, but that was Cindy's suggestion. That was a good one. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the Rossum Museum speaker series. My name is Sarah. I'm the researcher at the Rossum Museum. I am very pleased uh, to be introducing tonight's speaker, Cindy Devine. Um, we were laughing earlier. We were planning to have this presentation outside. We were optimistic that May would be gorgeous. And, uh, you know, it snowed, so you just never know. Um, but we are very pleased that we could pivot over to Zoom. Uh, so thank you all for joining us on Zoom. Um, I also want to thank uh, TDAC, Trail and District Arts Council, for their support of our speaker series always, and for Gabriella's Restaurant as well. And a special thank you to Chris Bowman, who lent us his great co-working space here in Rosslyn, where we could use his fast internet. And it's a wonderful setup in here, so we're really grateful for him to, uh, for his generosity in loaning the space. So, um, some regular Zoom things. Um, Cindy has given us permission to ask questions at any point during her presentation. So if you like, you can either use the chat feature and uh, we can put, uh, pose those questions to Cindy um, when they pop up in the chat. Um, otherwise, feel free to um, just unmute yourself or raise your hand and we'll, we'll see you. We've got two eyes on the whole group, so feel free to raise your hand and we can uh, pause and give you an opportunity to ask your question. And also, um, you're, we're going to have a Q&A time at the end, so you're welcome to ask more questions there. Um, we're going to keep you all muted just during the presentation, so like I said, just unmute or um, raise your hand if you've got something to say. Uh, I think that probably takes care of my notes. Um, you guys obviously all subscribe somehow to museum social media, so you knew this was happening. Um, we have a newsletter which always um, provides more information about things that the museum is doing. And we've got lots of social media channels, so feel free to watch those too and see what's coming up. We do a speaker series every month, so um, there's always something interesting to, to keep a lookout for. So without further ado, I have the privilege of introducing Cindy Devine, tonight's speaker. So Cindy Devine, queen of the downhill. She is a local legend. By accident, she found herself in the heart of the Canadian mountain biking scene in Deep Cove, BC, and quickly realized she had a knack for the sport. After only three years on a mountain bike and many wins already to her name, Cindy won the first official World Championship Downhill title in 1990. By 1992, Cindy had captured one gold and two bronze World Championship Downhill medals, three Kamikaze Downhill titles, three Canadian Downhill National Championship titles, and the classic Desert to Sea 150 mile mountain bike race win, Palm Springs to San Diego. To this day, Cindy is celebrated for her role as a racer, mentor, ambassador, and for elevating the sport of mountain biking in Canada. Cindy retired from racing in 1994 as a five-time undefeated Canadian national downhill champion. She continues to stay involved in mountain biking and has also returned to her rehab rehabilitation medicine career with a successful consulting company here in Rossland. So without further ado, I shall turn it over to Cindy. Let me unmute you for a sec. Okay. You mute me? The indigenous peoples whose land I've had the honor of living on. A big thanks to the museum for inviting me to speak here today and for their interest in the history of mountain biking. It's so funny to witness, witness myself become a museum piece and it's really hitting me now, over 30 years later, how I was indeed a part of mountain bike racing history. When Sarah asked if I would participate in a presentation, I had no idea what people might be interested in hearing. She gave me four questions from her curiosity and I wove my talk through these questions. 
How did cycling come into my life? How did mountain bike racing come about? What was it like for women in the first years of mountain bike racing? What brought me to Roslyn and how has mountain biking evolved since I moved here in 1990? The visual show I've created here is to show you the micro view of the journey for this kid's ticket to ride. Yet what interests me more is the macro perspective of a privileged white middle-class Canadian girl's lifestyle in the 60s and 70s before computers and internet and cell phones and video games. There was only school, outdoor activity, organized sport, board games, my easy bake oven, and nighttime TV. Every kid has their own ticket on the journey of life, and I feel my ticket was in that little red purse. The photo on the left is myself at four years old, looking very capable and prepared to step out into the world with shoes, gloves, and purse. The photo on the right is myself at 20 years old, well into my bike touring lifestyle. By 1981, I was 21 and I'd cycled across Canada and mountain biking still did not exist. But I believe these two components portrayed here of personal preparedness and pedaling endurance were crucial in my steep rise to become the first downhill mountain bike world champion in 1990. There are many paths to excellence and every one of us has excellence within. It just depends if that excellence is discovered, nurtured and noticed. Somehow our world really notices athletic champions, but we all know there are a variety of champions all around us. I don't believe excellence requires perfection, though sports medal podiums do require excellence. And the gold medalist is really just the most perfect performance for that day. What I know is that elite athletes exhibit and contain excellence and that the winners and podium athletes, the champions, are simply the ones that made the least amount of errors that event. My journey to mountain biking excellence was short in duration, 1987 to 1990. However, the seeds and fertilizers of this mountain bike champion were qu quietly developing for 25 years. I had no sports heroes I looked up to, no particular goals except to try as hard as I could with most things I attempted. Probably the baby of the family trying to be noticed. Apparently with children of alcoholic parents, there's always one sibling of the offspring that becomes the overachiever to get noticed by the parent, to become enough for them to quit their habit. I fit into that theory. Success has a lot to do with timing, being at the right place in the right era, doing the right action with excellence, practicing, searching out knowledge, good attitude, preparation and imagination, and a little spice of luck. I had no aspirations before 1990 to be a world champion of anything. My timing <clears throat> was being in the very first wave of female mountain bike racers. My excellence was in attitude was cultivated years before becoming a racer. I was skipped forward out of grade one, so obviously I had too much excellence at an early age. Once I got my first mountain bike, I practiced tons. As I began racing, I acquired knowledge by researching technical product, researching how to improve my mental and physical performance, studying courses and trails, asking a ton of questions, and having a very open and adventurous attitude. I was so prepared for races that my nickname on the circuit was Diddles because I was always diddling with my gear before the race. My luck in this success was that I was never badly injured, never torn apart by the media, which was much more private then than now, and that the day of big races, I happened to make less errors than other capable winners. I'm going to continue on with some of the cultivators of my international racing success. And I think cultural and travel experience are some of them. I had an ease with the whole concept of international racing travel and its adaptations. I was born in Venezuela in 1960 from a Canadian, Royal Canadian Air Force dad and a Farewish mother, both of them from World War II. And my dad had moved to Maracaibo to work for Gulf Oil assembling telecommunication towers 
And my mom was always taking us to the Faroe Islands, either from Venezuela or from BC every summer for my whole childhood. Apparently my mom had us kids smuggle various contraband food items back from the Faroes in our little suitcases. We had rest of fisk or grind or sherpa shirt, which is cured fish, whale meat and lamb legs. This was not one of my useful lifelong lessons. Apparently there's a whole generation of North American baby boomer oil brats, enough so that books are written about us. I just dis discovered this and I intend to investigate more. My first four years of life were on the beaches of Lake Maracaibo in the exotic tropics. I continue to manage my arachnophobia and my heebie-jeebies with large insects, which I learned from my mother's terror of all the tarantulas and cockroaches in our Venezuelan home, yard and car. My brother always had some size of iguana in his arms and my big sister lost an ear to the neighbor's ocelot. It was sewn back on. Thus the cultivation of my curiosity and fascination with nature and the outdoors. Isn't this the love of nature which gets us out on our mountain bikes? So we moved to North Van in 1964 from Venezuela at four years old and my most memorable bike and first ticket to ride was just this little Schwinn Stingray. It had metallic gold sparkle paint and, and bar end tassels with kick brakes and the Cedar Forest trails. I must have begun my comfort with standing on pedals right then, riding it like a BMX bike. I bombed around everywhere in what was then a very rural and cedar forested neighborhood. When I wasn't riding the bike, I was taking figure skating lessons, learning track and field, doing tricks on our huge backyard trampoline, overlooking Burrard Inlet off of Keith Road and Pemberton Heights. Capilano Elementary School was bittersweet for me. I was promptly skipped from grade one to two. Perhaps I was asking too many questions. This skip was my first memorable big life challenge. Back then I was verbally bullied with my nickname Lumpy because I had an unsightly lump on my right forehead from falling off a high wall in Maracaibo. And the final stress, which must have cultivated a desire to prove my worthiness was being the youngest of four kids with an alcoholic mom. I believe the beginning of my obsession to be perfect started here. I had something to prove. I wanted to be more than my school bully's nickname Lumpy. I wanted to be good enough for my schoolmates and for my mom. Once I started achieving sports ribbons and I had a peer group that admired me, the shame from my lumpy name slowly dissipated. The higher my recognitions, the less bully noise. That is just the way it worked for me. Unfortunately, it did not seem to improve my parents noticing me. I believe though that these mental adversities fit into that melting pot of cultivators of any champion. Unusual and adverse circumstances can create a high achiever. So my family moved from North Van to Ruskin, British Columbia in 1973 and I started high school at 13 years old at Garibaldi High. Thankfully, my lump had smoothed out and my nickname was gone. We had a 10 acre hobby farm in my dream of my own horse. I jumped in the 4-H club nearby and rode around the trails that were aplenty in this rural area. My interest in track and field that started in elementary expanded in high school and I enjoyed every discipline and practice and competed in all of them. What I find so interesting is that the mental and physical development I gained as an ordinary active Canadian kid was non-specific and completely varied, but oh so crucial in the future as yet unknown development of excellence in a brand new sport that was far in my future. I got a fresh start in Ruskin, but I kept up that high achiever mandate as it helped me with the stress of relocating and entering high school as the unknown one, the outlier. I felt safe being an academic nerd, plus a school athletic jock. It was a great way to spend my high school years. More cultivators of performance excellence log boom balance for timing and coordination, and of course, pedaling power and endurance on, on my first road bike. My high school summers included lots of long stretches of Stave Lake log boom walking to find solitary tanning and diving spots. 
And this was the beginning of my road riding endurance. My weekend rides were from Ruskin to English Bay and back on the number one highway and the Dudney Highway routes. This is apparently 144 kilometers return. How and why does a 14 year old do that alone? I still don't know. I don't know what drove me other than the adventure, the need for independence, for escape, and a sense of control over my life. My parents had no clue I was off on these solo adventures. I remember the police pulling me over once on the number one freeway, asking me to get off the freeway shoulder. I was in running shorts and a bikini top, no helmet or gloves, of course. And I recall trying to explain that it was a much shorter route if I could just stay on the freeway. I had no idea how unusual and unique I may have seemed to those police officers. So more high school uh, cultivators for me included being on every team I could from the basketball, volleyball, field hockey, rugby, tennis team. And I would fully commit to seven school teams in a year. I was good at all the sports, but rarely the champion. Being part of the team gave me a sense of a well-functioning family. As a teenager, being away from home was the best place for me. I knew this. School and after-school curriculums saved me from the struggles of an alcoholic mother. It, in retrospect, I see how I was trying really hard to excel, mostly so my parents would notice me and be proud of my achievements, and perhaps that I would be enough for something to change at home. Sadly, that never happened. My parents were of such another era, born after World War I, growing up through the Depression and then having World War II. For them, life was not about recreation. It was not about following your muse or taking holidays. Being present for their children's life, its successes and failures was just not their parenting style. I was given the basic security of a child's needs, but not the mental emotional interest. Still, I kept trying to be noticed by them. Specific support, encouragement, and attention came from my high school teachers and other involved parents, and I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> Looking at this compounded development of, of athleticism and an overachiever mentality makes it no surprise that I could be one of the most prepared women to excel at a new sport of cycling on dirt. Oh, and let's not forget the non-athletic contributors to sports excellent and discreet future mountain bike racer cross training, diaphragm strengthening through singing in the school choir and visualization and imagery skills through school drama club. These were parts of my growing up and apparently I was pretty good at it or at least sang above anyone else. All building blocks, fertilizer cubes for mountain bike racing success. If I'd been a band member and played a wind instrument, my diaphragm power may have been even better. So I do suggest people play wind instruments. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> that girl, yeah. I've been asked over the years who my mentors were. And these are them, Mary Tyler Moore, that girl and the flying nun. My heroines, they were strong-minded women, they had clear values, and they had tons of feisty get up and go. They gave me no doubt that I could do anything I chose to as a woman. Female athlete mentors were not on my radar at all. So let's get back to the other mountain bike champion cultivators. In 1978, I learned to windsurf during my UBC years, living at Jericho Beach. And this boom gripping, pulling and pushing developed hand strength for hanging onto future mountain bike handlebars rattling down slopes with no front suspension. From in 1980 to 84, I was either road riding to commute 35 to 120 kilometers return on work days, or I would road cycle tour Rupert to Vancouver across Canada from Newfoundland to Vancouver, the South Pacific, Hawaii, Fiji, Cook Islands, New Zealand, and another trip across Europe from Rome to Amsterdam, just when Chernobyl blew. I only have these 1980 photos of my very first tour with three rehab medicine faculty schoolmate girls, all adventurous tough women in our short shorts and tiny tops, bare hands and heads. 
1983, after cycling in New Zealand, I was smitten with New Zealand and I discovered Queenstown. I lived there three years and I got to ride my first Gary Fisher mountain bike along a grassy double track on the edge, edge of Lake Wakatipu. The combination of my love of pedaling and love of hiking into nature on dirt paths was presented to me in one funny looking package, the first early mountain bike. By 1987, I'd returned to Vancouver just for two weeks to say hello and goodbye to my friends and family. I was immigrating to New Zealand with permanent residency and a physio job in Queenstown. I never left BC as home again, mostly because I experienced the mountains of BC in Whistler, and I realized I could discover parts of New Zealand within BC. Plus, I fell head over heels for a deep cove boy who lived in Whistler and showed me serious mountain biking. That summer of 1987, I bought a Rocky Mountain Discovery, which you see in these Whistler area photos. For my new buddies at the Deep Cove Bike Shop, notice the continued lack of helmet wearing of this era. So my first ticket to mountain bike race came, back, came in Whistler. We started racing for our local sports shop, Jim McConkey's and Milo's Market, which is now called Nestor's Market. This was very grassroots and before any monetary sponsorship. Soon Deep Cove supported me with my first major Rocky Mountain Bikes con contract for sponsorship. Deep Cove Bike Shop was the first and apparently remains the only exclusive fat tire only bike shop in BC. Deep Cove Bikes and their disciples charted and built most of the original trails on the North Shore Mountains. I learned some of my technical skills on their new trails of 1988, such as severed dick and cut your bars. Notice again, no gloves, optional helmet and glasses, and a fair bit of hike a bike biking during racing. Because remember we had 28, 38, 48 cranks up front and with only 13, 28 on the back. And now most people have a 10, 52 on the back. So just very difficult for climbing many things. Very tough gear ratios for steep climbing. And check out the cool bull moose handlebar stem combo and the very narrow handlebars. Oops, okay. So we were racing on U brakes on the right and then V brakes were the biggest thing. We had rigid frames, narrow rims and tires, very steep head angles. They were 71 degrees at one point. Now most people are on 67 degree head angle. So the same skinny rims we used for uphill cross country, downhill or slalom jumps. We didn't have wider rims to put, put through the trauma. My new Whistler and Deep Cove friends encouraged me to join them attending lots of local and provincial races and some just over the US border. I got that Rocky Mountain sponsorship in 1988, $800 a month for expenses to travel Western Canada and the USA, which was awesome in those days. This led to my own free agent career over the next eight years, accumulating a variety of paying sponsors for bikes, helmet, shoes, glasses, toe grips, tires, eyewear. Some paid bonuses for any magazine coverage where their product was visible, and of course for podium finishes. I'm so grateful for all the years of financial support and all of the Shimano and Specialized All Racers technical support tents in these early racing days. So we're gonna show just a couple of clips of some of the old that I managed to change from VHS to digital. And um, so I'd like you to see that just to give you a laugh. Let me do this in the other room so you can. From the I think it's coming out now. Yeah. We're all good? Also yeah, she said. In Milton, Ontario, the Canadian Tire Mountain Bike Championships. Hello, everyone. I'm Jerry Dobson. And what a fascinating day of off-road cycling we have lined up for you. Three major events. The big event of the day is the Pro-Am, featuring some of the best off-road cyclists in the world, including the current world champion, Ned Overend. We have the Dual Downhill, which is an event that resembles pro slalom in skiing. And the first event of the day is the Uphill Sprint. 
Working with me today, a former world cycling champion, Gord Singleton. And let's check in with Gord now for a few words on today's race. I'm at the base of the ski hill here at Glen Eden. It's the start of the uphill sprint. It's a mass start event. The riders have to negotiate the slippery climb to the top of the hill with the winner being the first one over the finish line, unless he puts his foot down, at which point he's immediately disqualified. On your so here we go. There will be two races. The women are up first, followed by the men. There are five women in this race, and away they go up this very steep hill. And two of them have broken away. That is Cindy Devine, uh, number 27, and Lisa Mewick, number 30. So it looks like they are breaking away slightly here on this very steep hill, Gord. The key here is to start out really fast and strong. Get your legs going. Keep the momentum. As the race gets steeper and steeper up the climb, it's hard. But once you lose your momentum, to keep the speed going. You see the girls here. They're pushing and pulling on the pedals as hard as they can. Trying to keep it going to the top. And that am camera angle there showed you just how steep it was as the two of them go up here. That is Lisa Muick on the left, Sydney Devine on the right. And they are neck and neck right here on the very steep part of this hill. And, oh, there, uh, Lisa Muick, a problem for her. She slipped out of the toe strap there, and she could be in trouble. It's forced her off the course. She has lost the momentum, and it is now up to Cindy Devine. This race is hers, and she wants it. Well, there's no way at this point in the race that Lisa Muick can come back after pulling her foot up. It looks like Cindy Devine is going to take it all the way to the top. We can see her struggling, but she's staying on top of the pedals. The key is to push and push and push, not to give up the momentum. She's taking it all the way to the finish here. Cindy Devine, a Canadian girl for the Rocky Mountain team. Check she's going to win this race. Lisa Muick falls right out of it. Tell me, what was that like coming up there? It's just great. just very expensive. Was it easier today? I mean, the conditions were pretty good, I guess. Oh, great. I was touring whether I was going to gear up for that steep bit, but I went in my lowest, lowest. It was a good idea. <laughs> And we've just seen them come up this hill en masse, and now we'll see them go down the hill two at a time. The next race of the day is the dual downhill, and Gord, I guess it's a lot like a pro slalom event in skiing. Yes, the riders not only have to negotiate the steepness of the hill, they have to go in and out of the poles where it's very, very slippery. The rider moving on to the next round is the one who can negotiate the fastest time over the two runs. So we pick it up with a women's final, and you are looking at Cindy Devine, the winner of the women's uphill sprint. Her opponent in this final is L.D. Brown, and so they're just about set, and there they go, and they have to be very careful not to miss those poles, Gord. And we see how steep the hill is in the race on the uphill portion, now going down at a faster speed. Bike handling is a real key factor here. They have to stay back on the saddle, keeps their center of gravity back on the pedals, allows them to take these turns at a higher rate of speed. And they're very tentative in the upper portion of the hill, but they pick up the speed now. You can see Cindy is opening up a lead here as she really is coming down. She almost loses it right there, but she keeps on the bike and she wins the first run. And so now they go back up the hill and they'll do it all over again. And the woman with the lowest total time will be the winner. And of course, they change sides in the second run here, so it evens out. So that is Eleni Brown closest to the camera in this one. Well, if there ever is a difference between racing on one side or the other, they split it up. One has a chance at the left and the right. It looks like they're even at this portion of the hill. They're very close in the upper portion of the hill as they are very tentative there. It is very steep, so they have to be cautious. But you'll see as they get closer to the bottom, that is when they start. And Sydney Devine is starting to move once again. So this is very cool. Sydney Devine is in front, and there she is opening it up right now, and she wins it again. So Sydney Devine is the winner of the dual downhill. Excellent result for Sydney Devine, winner of two races here this afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I just wanted to include that clip because Elodie and I in that slalom. Little did we know that in a year's time, we would be the gold and the silver world medalist for downhill. So I just thought it was quintessential of seeing us in our early days as the two Canadian girls. <clears throat> and then, you know, we become uh, Canadian sweethearts when we won the world. So the next clip is the U.S. Nationals.
are more adventurous than others. This is mountain bike racing. It is not for the faint of heart nor weak of lung. This is dirty, dusty, bone jarring work. <laughs> Big Bear Lake, California, home of Snow Summit Ski Area and the National Mountain Bike Championships. Oh, the racers have conquered the summit, but what goes up the mountain must also go down. It's time to gather your thoughts, check your equipment, and prepare for the mile-long downhill race. Thanks, Sarah. Well, I hope you guys like that because it is so classic old with the narrow bars and the narrow rims and oh my gosh. Um, so I, uh, and yeah, you're right. The, the horror, when I moved here, I was wearing that neon stuff, that, those neon colors it shocked everybody. So we are moving to the Number 17, I think. Yeah. There we go. I don't see that. Oh, there we go. So uh, <clears throat> from beginner to elite racer started for me in Whistler where I was living. I was full-time training and racing from 1988 to 1994, but in Whistler from 1988 to 1990 before I moved up here. And in 1990, the UCI included mountain biking as an official world championships. And, and eventually it became an Olympic sport in 1996 for cross country, not for downhill. But in 1990, the first Canadian national team, Canada had our first Canadian national team for mountain biking and the UCI women's downhill event was the first medal race that Saturday morning. And in September that morning, Canada got the two world championship medals, as I've mentioned, Elodie Brown got the silver and I was the gold and we were less than half a second apart. It was a really great day for Canada. And we raced the first little tiny rock shocks ever made and it was front suspension history. 
It took another two years before rear suspension came up in the circuit. And in 1992, Juliana Furtado of Juliana Bikes was the first woman to have won both a world cross country and a world downhill. She tore down that Bromont course on her full suspension GT bike and she stunned the downhill crowd. She'd only been that cross country star before this, not, not on the world downhill podiums. So it re really let us realize that suspension makes a difference uh, staying on course and, stay, and staying fast. I tried to stay satisfied with two additional world bronzes in 91 and 92, but remember the high achiever perfectionist, it was, it was difficult for me to not want to just have gold once you've got gold. <laughs> So you see, technology was changing so quickly in the early 90s that if you didn't have quality leading edge technology or you were being paid to R&D certain underperforming forks, wheels, tires, or brakes, my gosh, it was frustrating. At this point, being a solo free agent in such evolving and inequitable technology was slowly turning me away from my racing career. I was losing patience and I had no idea where the sport was going and how I fit in. Over the years, I even had some sponsors telling me that suspension was just a fad and it would never take off with mountain bikes. So you can see where, where I've come from. So the museum asked me to comment on women's coverage in the sport. And so I, I scraped out some of these um, articles that I was in. Women were very popular in the sport, perhaps because early on we were so few. And these are just some clips from my stored portfolio. And I laugh at the article, No Feminine Fears, because as you know, I have a terrible fear of spiders. And honestly, I experienced lots of intermittent fears of serious injury during my career. I witnessed plenty of serious wounds, fractures, head and spinal cord injuries, but the courage of all the other participants around me boosted my bravery to literally keep up with the pack. The pro women riders of the 80s and 90s did get plenty of international magazine coverage. And don't forget, there was no internet back then, no Facebook or Instagram, no mass media, it really was magazine coverage was what you, or on the TV, on these little uh, uh, coverages on TV. Your presence in the media was not really under your control. If a magazine editor liked you, you were in luck. Pushing your presence into the media was a physical schmoozing kind of effort. You actually had to be there and be sociable at the right time. This was another part of my luck in this sport because as a quite a private person, I would not have proceeded if sponsorship and media requirements were as they are today. I even had difficulty with the schmoozing part and had to force myself out into the crowds after a race. The racing life is spe spectacular to hear about and the community of my racing buddies and other teams was unforgettably kind and supportive. However, it is a time of such focus and self-centeredness to succeed that it can also be frustrating and lonely and challenging to your self-worth. Once you're on the podium and given titles like Queen of the Downhill, your easy days of being the underdog are gone. You're in the limelight. There are sponsor, fan, media expectations, and that's a whole other head game to master beyond simple physical, simple physical excellence. When you're on the top, there's such a long way to fall down. The obscure and underdog climb up really is the easy part. So these are just some um, examples of who I was when I moved to Raza and I had just won the Worlds. Check out my narrow bars and my, when I'm in my rainbow jersey, I've got those really narrow bars and look at the gears and the huge fat brake levers that are so clunky compared to what we have now. Um, why did I move from Whistler to Rosalind? Many of the races before we had World Cups were at altitude in the mountains of the USA. And I suffered only living at 2000 feet at Whistler. My hemoglobin just wasn't enough for that kind of racing because we did race all of them. We raced the cross countries and the uphills. We did it all. So you needed the lungs. And so I searched for a place in BC that was higher elevation. And it was either Kimberly or Roslyn. I'd never been east of Hope. 
So Greg and I decided on Roslyn from good word of other skier friends who said the ski hills just did not compare and Red Mountain was the place to be. It was tree skiing for winter visual skills training for me and cross country skiing and indoor bike training for cardio and lake speed. I spent my springs in Palm Springs and Moab and Sedona for early season bike racing fitness training. Eventually I started to specialize in downhill only as my innate MVO2 was just not enough to podium in cross country world cups. I would never do better than 12th in the world in the cross country worlds. Here's a picture of when I arrived in Raza and this is what the locals were riding. They were riding those Fort Shepherd Sandy Hills down there and um, pretty much with that, those steep head angles that I was talking about with those old fashioned bikes of ours. Um, they rode in sweatpants, wool socks and hiking boots and straight down these sandy slopes. They were also riding straight down the south face of Red Mountain where we, we actually have a beautiful red top trail zigzagging up there now, but we were going straight down the south face. And um, the baseline trails of Monte Cristo, KC, Technogrind, Oasis, Green Door and Rubberhead existed. But a lot has happened since then, as you know. And some trails that don't exist now, but were part of our original network were uh, Rock and Roll, Slug, and Center Star Gulch, and the Molly Mines Network off of Red Mountain. So what happens after pro retirement? I was guest coaching for all through the Northwest till about 2004. And then I started Divine Ride in Roslyn with great Kirsty Exner, that was wonderful. And that lovely Divine Ride logo is from Liz Arsenault. So that was a, a wonderful um, creation of hers. We all watched the KCTS grow its network. Um, I see Roslyn become a summer destination for mountain biking in those 30 years I've been here. And like the hot skiers that ski red, this place grew plenty of hot bikers, both kids and adults. And truly nowadays, I am really a very average mountain biker. This is a clip from a Roslyn newspaper that sums up local mountain bike history. And I'd just like to read it out. Roslyn is steeped in the mountain bike racing history of North America. While the small community of 3,500 people hosted the 93 NORAM championships, the history of bike racing in Roslyn goes back much further with the original Rubberhead Bike Festival. I had no idea about this part. The Rubberhead started in 1985 on fully rigid bikes with a cross country race on the Rubberhead Trail in Lower Roslyn, a Mount Tam style downhill race on the wagon road from Roslyn to Warfield, that must have been exciting, a ski inspired dual slalom and an innovative techno grind race where the cross country races were penalized time for dabbing on the highly technical sections. The Rubberhead was hugely popular at a time when mountain biking was exploding on the scene. I bet you could count the number of mountain bikers on your fingers and toes when we first started, says pioneer Terry Miller. It was new and exciting. Based on the success of the Rubberhead and strong volunteer and racer enthusiasm, Roslyn bid and won the right to host the NORAM Championships for 93. That was pretty much the last big race I did here. At the zenith of the early mountain bike revolution, 400 participants, 200 volunteers, 600 people involved in these championships. <clears throat> Not counting spectators and most of Roslyn residents who didn't have a choice as the course literally went through their backyards. So if anybody knows where the name Rubberhead, the eraser head comes from, we want to know. So <laughs> let us know. And then I wanted to talk uh, just, just a review. I'm sure some of you know, but it's pretty interesting to look at the development of our trail system and with it, the cost of houses. <laughs> So in 1990, when I moved here, houses were 25 to 50,000. Mine was actually 29. Um, and the trail system becomes part of the Roslyn official community plan. By 96, KCTS was established and we got our first proper trail, the Centennial. In 2000, KCTS finally had 12 trails. By 2003, that was tripled to 37. 2004 Revolution Cycles Bike Shop opens, thank you. And the Divine Ride Bike Camps started. <clears throat> By 
06, we had 39 trails. By 07, Kootenai mountain biking and Betty Gohard begins. And by 210, 43 trails, 211, 51, and presently 70 trails, which is really a lot, remember, to maintain. That's the, that's the tough part. We can have all the trails in the world, but after a winter, they're all trees down and all sorts of stuff. So having 70 maintained trails is incredible. And by now the house prices are up from 350 to 950K. So a lot has changed. And my final um, slide is talking about ordinary to excellence to ordinary again. And that to me, life seems like a sine wave where we have pulses of closeness and separation, socialization and solitude. We have positive and negative experiences, wins and losses. And that's why the saying this too shall pass and the only thing you can be certain of is change makes so much practical sense to me. My world championship experience was just one sine wave of excellence in my life. There may be more, likely out of the sports realm. If you dissect your own life, you'll see your own waves of excellence and mediocrity, and you will witness the natural rhythm of your own change. The takeaways from my cycle career were please really celebrate and install your accomplishments. I do regret that I didn't um, really, really feel each time I won a medal. When I won the Worlds, I was already thinking about what the next medal would be like. And it's hard to, to get out of that habit of um, always having to look forward to, to make further goals. And I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. So please celebrate and install your accomplishments. And um, what I took away from my cycle career is a lifelong commitment to inner and outer health and fitness. And another big thing is to allow physical and mental recovery when in doubt, rest. And the big thing I learned is I am enough, as is, I am enough. So personally, I really enjoy my present life of mediocrity tucked away here in Rosalind. And now my effort in excellence is in the emotional and spiritual growth realm. So thanks for listening. And I'm here if you have any questions. <laughs> Or not. Everybody's clapping for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if there are questions from the audience, please um, raise your hand or unmute yourself and um, listen to Cindy. She covered it all. She said everything. <laughs> You are getting lots of thanks. Yeah. There's a question asking about toe grips. Toe grips. Yes. Hi, Joni. Tell me about toe grips. Good ah. question. Am I hearing this from a flat peddler? Yes. So we we all had the toe toe clips that you probably see on some old road bikes, even, but I turned I got something new it was it was a toe strap it was diagonally it was called a power strap it was the latest and greatest and I was well paid to to use it um but nobody thought about going flat pedals back in those early days and and we didn't have cleats so we had some form of a toe clip and when you came out of it it was a hell of a time getting back in so it was really I almost lost the worlds because of my toe clip. I came out and I couldn't get back in and I lost time and I thought for sure it was, that was it. That's a very lucky that I won by that half a second and, and got the gold medal because I had a huge amount of time trying to get back in my toe clip. Hi, I'm Kim, I'm, I'm in Vancouver and I'm wondering if you're still friends with Elodie. Oh yes. Absolutely. <laughs> We're best friends. That's great. She's doing some yeah. great things for the biking world here. That's for sure. Yeah. She's one of the girls that kind of was always very um, capable and um, she stayed in the bike industry. A few of us gals that we were very close to all of us circuit gals from the 90, 90s, um, a few of us pulled right back. Some, you know, some of the nurses went back to nursing and 
uh, Els was one of one that stayed in the industry all the way through. So yeah, good on her. She fit right in and still does. She does. She's fantastic. So Andy said in the comments that he raced in Milton also. I know. Yeah. Andy, were you there that when I was racing that year? No, I wasn't. It was um, early 90s and uh, ah. Early, early mid nineties, and they were they were hosting cross country races on the mountain, so um, down there for a couple of Ontario Cups or whatever. Yeah, so I wasn't I didn't do the downhill thing. I didn't have a uh, nerves. So, uh, but but I do you remember cross country? Do you remember the steepness of that slope that we had to oh, climb up? Uh, well, I remember that was part of the cross country course, and and you had to dismount and, and run walk it. I mean, it was too, to, to do it on a cross country course, it was just too steep. So yes. I, I remember everybody was getting off the bike at the bottom and, and uh, yeah, having- Hike having a biking up. Bike, hike a bike. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was steep. I mean, for an Ontario race course, it was, well, that is the Bruce Peninsula right there. People might know yeah. that. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very rocky little outcropping in Southern Ontario on Lake Ontario. Very cool. I had a question about flat pedals or clipless. What do you What do you use now? I'm I'm uh, cleated in, ah, mostly exactly. because I, I I still have a cross country love. I mean, I love pedaling more than standing on my pedals. So pedaling is improved for me by being cleated in. Yeah, clip clipless pedal. Mm hmm. Yeah. Good to know. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. Really enjoyed this presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Sunil Singh, there was a fire road up the side. The side of which slope? There's a fire road up the side of the slope you wrote that was hard to ride too. Was that also in Milton? The fire road? I don't remember. Sunil, can you explain your question? Okay. You Milton, yeah. Ah. She knows it too. <laughs> so everything was hard to climb in Milton. <laughs> I guess I pretty much covered it. Yes, you did. A plus. That was excellent. Oh, yeah. oh. Excuse me if I may, I have a question. Hi, Joni. Cindy from Palm Springs, we miss you. Come back to oh. Palm Springs soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see why you're a relic in the museum. It has been over 30 years. So <laughs> glad to have known you all that time. And you have been an inspiration. And I love the um, parts of your talk where you not only talked all about the technical but also about your inspiration, because I think that ties into our everyday life. So no wonder we're still friends. So thank you. Well, See you when you get Thanks, Joni. <laughs> Joni was in my uh, racing career life. She was a manager and yeah, she's definitely, she stepped out of the racing world as well though. <clears throat> Angela, I think, has a question too. Yeah, I did. Thanks. Cindy, you've been a great inspiration even to people who aren't athletic on bikes. And not just an inspiration who says, go do it, but really super helpful. I know. Thank you. What do you get out of riding your bike now? I mean, where's the joy now? Why aren't you burned out? Ooh. I know you're not, but why? No. Oh. When I sit on a saddle, my legs take over. It's almost another part of me, and they just start whizzing around like pistons, and they create this endorphin in me instantly. I only have to pedal a few fast, vigorous pedal strokes, and I get a rush of um, joy within me, and it still, it still happens. So... It must have been something that was created as a kid and it gave me that freedom and all those things I talked about, that sense of control and, and it's still, it does, and a sense of relief. So it's, it's almost, um, it's becoming innate. 
my legs just take off. It never feels like a chore. Do you also find, I'm curious, do you also find that when you're biking, so whether it be in the mountains or on the road or whatever, you have to be present? Like you have to be in the moment, right? You can't sort of let your mind go everywhere. And so it's almost meditative. That's my perspective. Definitely. Certainly mountain biking. <laughs> You can go, you yeah, can start yeah. to wander when you're road riding, your mind can wander because it's a little less, you're not looking so closely, but that's the beauty of mountain biking is it forces you to be present. Yeah. Otherwise 100%. you're going to, yeah, yeah. So it is a form of, of um, like walking meditation, but it's instead cycling meditation when you're, well, even whether, even when you're not good at it, because you're looking at where you're going, but particularly when you're comfortable with it, there's a sense of ease and with observation. Okay, Mike is curious uh, if you could share a bit about your pre-race routine. Diddling, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, for downhill, there was a ton of Im uh, imagery for visualizing the course, every, every rock and root and corner and rut. Like I really, it almost stopped me from sleeping because I would play it in my mind again and again and again until I knew that course completely. So there was a huge amount <clears throat> of visual prep, which is more in downhill than cross country, no doubt. Um, and there, everyone has their little rituals of when they don't eat and what they eat before the race that's that I, I had that as well um I definitely needed quiet and and space and solitude so I was sometimes called the princess by my teammates because I had to get I had to have my own room and you know once you're a champ you kind of you can get away with that stuff of not sharing a room with any of your room, your teammates. So they did nickname me the princess because I did have, I needed that quiet and that, that focus. Whereas some of the other gals were very social and they could be out, not necessarily partying, but they could be out and be social the night before the event. And I would, I would not be able to do that. And the morning, you know, you have to do the warm up like you would. I'm not sure if Mike's asking in a cross country sense or a downhill sense, because there is a different physical prep for sure. Mike, do you want to ask uh, more questions? Do you have a follow up? He's writing curious notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says that's enough. Okay. Um, Gabe is wondering what your favorite mountain bike trail in town is or your favorite local cycle tour spot. Oh, that's Erica. Sorry, Erica. Ah. Mountain bike trail or touring area? Oh, well, there's, it's not, it wouldn't be here for touring, for cycle touring, um, just because of our, uh, it's pretty hard to match Europe with all the small villages that you hit, you know, within 20K rather than, are huge distances where you're looking at the terrain. Like I found cycling across Canada, one of the toughest uh, visually to do because it's just too long in between quaint things to see, you know, unless you haven't seen BC for or uh, Canadian forests from Thunder Bay to Manitoba and the prairies. So I would have to say tours are, are more in Europe. Um, and I, I don't think I can tell you my favorite trail here. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, I really like Colonel Angus lately. And um, I must admit, I do have an e-bike now. And so I can really ride without the back pain that I developed from crashing you know, down mountains and blowing out all my discs with no suspension. So it's really helped me um, ride longer without any pain. And so uh, a ride I just did today, which I really love, is um, Merle Heights Chainsaw Bluff. Speaking of injuries, Nicole is wondering if you can talk about recovering from bike injuries and how you return comfortably to the saddle after injuries. Ooh, well, 
Um, I've never recovered from the, you know, multiple lumbar disc herniations and all that and the degenerative disc disease that was sort of compounded over all those years. And so it's really just management. But um, I have a new injury. I have a thumb sprain, which most lots of bikers get falling off. Mine was from ski skating just in the end of April. But how do you recover? Tape it. <laughs> Tape it really well. And um, you have to alter your your trails to uh, work around your injury. So if your knee's hurting you, you can't do a ton of climbing. And if your thumb is hurting you, you can't do a lot of rough terrain because you're trying to grip the bars and it's hurting your thumb. So a lot of it's common sense. And as a physio, of course, you know, we don't always practice what we preach because I do notice that my thumb is really sore from doing chainsaw and all that today. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you just really have to alter your trail to what your capacity is at that point and ask most of us physios are um, bikers so ask your physio of the trails that she thinks would be suitable for you to get back out with your back or your ankle or whatever it is but the smoother the better for most of the body that's what I'm noticing now at 61 that the smoother the trail the you know the the happier my body is. And that's what the beauty of this e-bike is that it has six inches of suspension. I've never ridden that sort of suspension in my whole career. So having that much plush is just fantastic. Samuel <laughs> wants to know which e-bike you have. Oh, the Specialized Levo. Yeah, and I've never had a 67 degrees head angle. So experiencing that ease of dropping down steep slopes is you know, off of my little rocky element with the 70 and a half head angle. It's uh, quite a wonderful thing. So I, I, it's just the weight, the better suspension and uh, the more you're carrying up the hill. So it's, it's how much you can manage, how strong you are. And Tash has, first of all, disagreed that you're an average mountain biker. <laughs> and second of all, has invited you to go e-biking. Oh, there you go. yay. <laughs> Tash, right on. There's someone who'll do a chainsaw with me. And I noticed that you said, don't quit mountain biking and sit on your couch. Just change your trail. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adapt your trail as you would for if you're a hiker and you all of a sudden have a sore knee. You just have to walk the flats and, and uh, be patient till you can get to the levels that you're you're hoping for and and get guidance. I mean, physios are great at that sort of stuff. So you need a little help because usually your ego will push you faster than than is than your body wants you to do, than your broken part wants to do. Just because we love it. Any other questions for Cindy? Thank you all. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for attending and uh, we'll put a recording of this presentation up on our website when it's ready to go. So you can share it around and pass it around and watch it again and again and again. <laughs> uh, bye. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you.